This is the Innovation Forum. Hello, welcome to the Innovation Forum, coming to you from the ACS offices here in Barangaroo, Sydney. And tonight, we're talking about deep tech. Sounds ominous, doesn't it? It's the cutting edge of technology, things you didn't know. And while it might sound ominous, and some people think it's all about artificial intelligence, AI, and the end of the world, in fact, it could be the saviour of the world. We have a fantastic panel. We're going to debate all the issues on it, tell you a lot you didn't know about, but you're going to be hearing a lot about, and you'll be ahead of the pack on knowing. So let's start with a little bit of background on what is deep tech. From mapping our existing horizons to finding new ways to improve the way we live, deep tech is best described as technology at the bleeding edge. Deep tech is really something that typically we haven't done before. It's the application of technologies in a combination that's new. It's likely to disrupt an industry. It's likely to address a really complex problem in society. It's where the application of science, technology and machine learning has the power to change the world. And changing the world, one family at a time, are the Tran brothers at Harrison AI. So our first project was in the field IVF, where uh, we have a partnership with Virtus Health, the leading IVF providers here in Australia and Europe, uh, to develop an artificial intelligence software that help embryologists select the best embryo for, for IVF transfer. The collaboration with Virtus Health stands to dramatically improve IVF outcomes for hopeful parents. So traditionally in the past, uh, an embryologist need to grow a human embryo in multiple test tubes uh, over five days, for example. Um, and during that time, the embryologist need to make a judgment on which one of those embryos is the best one to put back into mum at the end of the five days and ultimately create a baby. Harrison AI uses time-lapse video inside the embryo incubator to build an AI model that analyzes the embryos multiplying. Using machine learning, the model then compares the findings to a large data set of 10,000 previous videos and predicts, based on previous successful pregnancies, which embryo is likely to become a baby. Able to absorb and process such a vast amount of information makes it a useful tool to help guide clinical decisions. Uh, if you can select the embryo with the highest chance of pregnancy, you can prioritise putting that embryo back first and ultimately shorten the times that a couple would take to get pregnant. Following its initial success, the Sydney-based duo eagerly awaited further clinical trials, which could transform the future of reproductive health. Doing technology is exciting, it's fast-moving, but it's really rewarding when you actually impact a patient's lives. So I know our families and friends who've been through IVF journey, it can be very emotional and financially taxing for them. So by using technology like AI to give them a better chance of being successful, we're really happy about that. The brothers are now working on using artificial intelligence in the field of radiology and are looking for funding to help grow their business. Elsewhere, the team at Soul Machine are creating deep tech with a friendly face. We're creating digital humans that can see, hear and feel your emotions. Um, and really interestingly, um, they can respond back to you in an emotional way and they do that um, completely autonomously. ANZ Bank in New Zealand have Jamie. Um, they've had her in public now for about 12 months. What can I help you with? Um, and have had rave reviews. A lot of people look at what we're doing and it's really cool stuff and it seems like it's fantasy, but the reality is there's a whole lot of organisations that are getting value out of what we're doing now um, and there's a lot more to come. Deep tech is a growing industry and for a very good reason. In areas like quantum computing, it has the potential to find the answers to some of our biggest problems. Problems that a quantum computer will be able to solve fall into two categories. There's your simulating quantum systems type problem and your sort of solving big mathematical problems. So in the area of simulating quantum systems, these are things like doing quantum chemistry simulations better, doing biology simulations better, and an application of that could be de de designing new materials, um, designing new drugs, doing analysis of how drugs interact with proteins. And then on the other side, in the mathematical area, this could be improving our optimization algorithms or our machine learning algorithms or very, very far into the future, being able to do factoring 
faster. But there are challenges. Building skills in these new technology sets, particularly in deep tech domains, is difficult, um, it's complex, and it's really hard to, to bring those skills from the market. So investment in skills um, and having the right tools and technologies and knowing you know, what you can do in-house and how you partner with others um, to get the best outcome and maybe not replicate something that's already there. Ultimately, the future is for us to decide. Joining me now to discuss what our future looks like are three experts in the field who are helping to build it. Let me introduce Dr. Rob Newman, CEO of Location Intelligence Company. Nearmat, welcome to the show. Thank you. From the University of Sydney, machine learning expert, Professor Sally Cripps, and welcome to you too. And from the venture capitalist from Telstra Ventures, uh, Albert Bialinko. Thank Welcome. you very much. Uh, look, before we get into what you each do and bring to this area, I want to get your definition of it because I had not... I mean, I'd vaguely heard the theme. I didn't know deep tech was a thing. Is it something we need to know about? Sum up to quickly what you think deep tech means to you. Uh, for me, deep tech is anything that's had a, a big investment in some technology that's disruptive to human behaviour. So if we've researched it for a long period of time and it creates something fundamentally new, that's deep tech. The example we all talk about at the moment is artificial intelligence, but that's only one piece. There's a lot of components that come together to create something that, that is uh, helpful for humanity. Now, Sally, you, you are an expert in machine learning. Now, that's where deep and shallow, there are definitions there, aren't there? Well, yes, there are. So there's something called deep learning, which is a technique that we use in machine learning and which I think probably gave its um, deep tech its name. <coughs> Um, so, so for me, I think it's useful to talk uh, in talking about deep tech to talk about what it may not be, and to divide this digital disruptive uh, period into two groups. One of which I would call shallow tech, and that is where characterised by lots of data, you're doing relatively simple operations on that data to solve simple problems, typically. The operations are grouping people into categories that they have similar behaviour. You know, do you read Vogue? Do you read New Scientist? Do you read Time magazine? And then using that to try and predict what that person may buy in the so future. So that's shallow tech? That's shallow tech. Well, tell us what deep tech is. <laughs> so deep tech is dealing with complex problems which, for which there's no simple solution, for which there are many people that are needed in order to solve it. Data, funnily enough, is often very scarce in deep. In, in deep tech problems, uh, and the decisions of the, that, that you make in deep tech problems are important decisions that can have big consequences and they're not readily reversible. So they're the characteristics where deep tech comes into its own. Albert, you're a venture capitalist. Um, are you looking? Is that the big new thing? Do you look, oh, beauty, is that deep tech where, you know, the money's there? Um, tell us how you look at deep tech. Yeah, no, great question. So, to me, deep technology is all about is there some fundamental innovation that's occurred that's allowed us to do something that humanity couldn't do before? And so, usually, there's intellectual property there that you can protect with a patent, for example. And so, I actually... I'll disagree a tiny bit with you, Rob, here. So you can disagree I don't, a lot if you I, want. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't think it needs to necessarily take a long time uh, for, to develop deep tech, but it does need to be something that's, that's cutting edge, that a new innovation that just wasn't possible in the future. And to me, the thing I really like about deep tech, and it is definitely an area we invest in, is that it's more defensible. There are less people in the world that can innovate and create a LiDAR that lets self-driving cars see, for example, uh, then, you know, no offence, but a, you know, a survey, for example, a company that makes a survey, a, a software product that, that is a survey. Or an so, app. You or an app. The app. No, yeah. We all hate the apps and not deep technology. Well, the apps yeah. are necessary to get to the deep tech. You're going to appeal yeah. to the apps. OK. But actually, just picking up on Albert's point there, I think the... Um, to get something that is defensible and is disruptive, it does take a lot of investment. Otherwise, anybody could do it, right? It so. does. Yeah. It's true. I'm yeah. going to ask about your personal experience, Rob. You run mm. the deep tech company Neomap. Yes. Now, it's had remarkable success. I won't, I'm not going to say overnight because it's been 12 years in the making, but it's certainly going great guns. I think mm. best performing stock in the ASX in That's 2019. Correct. Now, that is something. So why is Neomap performing so well at the moment? Is it because it's in this deep tech space? What's the secret to your success? Oh, look, fundamentally, I think it's a combination of two things. You do need 
deep technology to create a technology moat. By that we mean kind of a defensible technology position. And our company started because we had Stuart Nixon, our founder, created a new way of collecting or observing the Earth. And it wasn't yeah, tell us a little bit about what it actually does. Yeah, so quite literally, uh, we build cameras that go in planes. And we, if you're familiar with satellite view, we do satellite view, but so much better. And it basically transforms the way businesses do their business. So instead of hopping in their car, driving on site to do an asset inspection, or to do a, um, an estimate or a quote for a job or plan a new construction site, they can do it from their desktop using our technology. And it's so clear, so up to date. We're updating uh, Sydney, for example, six times a year. Nobody does that. So it's deep technology enabled our business. And, um, and then the success has come from then working out how to apply that technology to solve a problem in, in society, right? And we literally save 45 million kilograms of carbon dioxide emissions every month, right? Sim simply because we're taking people out of cars. So those people who think, and we'll be getting that at the end, um, that kind of deep technology or anything too advanced can be risky, it also is important for the good. Yes. So are there other Australians in the space? Like, you're obviously a standout, but it is, is it something we're doing well? Look, we are, I think as, as Australians, we're very good. Sally's a perfect example of doing incredible technology development. I think where Australians aren't as good, and I'm hoping that Nearmap is a good example, and there are other companies that are doing it, is then being able to commercialise that. Uh, and right? we'll be talking and about we'll, that I, a little yes, bit we won't later go there, on. But, but, but that's the point. I think we are great technologists. We do see the opportunity, but there is much more we need to do as a nation so that we have more deep tech being developed and commercialised. Sally, you're leading the way in this machine learning that we talked about. Tell me a little bit about what it is and some of the incredible work you're doing. I mean, everything from mining companies to others. So, firstly, tell us what it is exactly and what are you doing and how it's being applied. OK, so I, I very much agree with Robert. I think it's, it's, it does take an awful long time, which is why it is people who are in it have such an advantage. But I also think, like Rob, that it's about choosing the right problem to do a lot of good too. So, so say, for example, uh, we want to know how to use the land that we stand on. So that's a pretty important problem. We're Australians. You know, do we, do we mine? Do we farm? Do we put it in a national park? Now, all of that involves, for example, knowing what lies underneath Australia. And that's an area that we can never get observations. Tell us about your specific area, though. For example, we talked about deep tech versus shallow tech. Machine learning versus deep learning, for example. Well, they're one and the same. Oh. So, 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 no, but deep learning is just a specific algorithm that machine learners use. Right. Okay. okay. So, so machine learning is 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 sort of computational statistics. It is just mathematical techniques, things that we do to learn from data. Is this like quantum computing, Australian of the Year? No. Michelle, no? No. So, so quantum computing would very much be deep tech, but it would not be on its own. So I can right. give you an example of a work that we're doing which involves... That's what we'd like. OK, so quantum sensing. So quantum sensing, we want to know what's under the ground, but we can't see what's under the ground. If we think of drill hole, it's going to be $100 million. So clearly that's not what we want to do. So we're working with a group from ANU where they actually freeze atoms down to absolute zero, which is about minus. 273.15 degrees Celsius. That's, so, and why is that important? Because they slow the atoms right down. And they slow the atoms right down, and then we measure the, the rate at which the atoms drop. And that tells us gravity, and that tells us something about what lies underneath. Hence why you might be working with a mining company like Newcrest, would it be? Well, we would, but it's, it's actually, that's just the physicists, that's just the data. It's then what you do with the data. So we use the data to construct probabilities of what the worlds lie beneath us. And that's very important in decision making. OK, well, at least I've learned the difference between quantum computing and quantum sensing. learning to know, sensing today. <laughs> yes. they, they, they were sounding the same to me. Now, Albert, Telstra Ventures uh, invests heavily in this uh, space, obviously. What are you seeing at the moment in the deep tech area here in Australia? Because I know you invest in uh, overseas as well, but just tell us what's uh, a bit about what your company's doing and what it's like, what the market's like in Australia first. Yeah, of course. So Telstra Ventures is a venture capital firm that's been going for about eight years now. We've invested more than 400 mil in 59 technology companies so far. And the fund is an independent entity, but is backed by Telstra and Harbourvest, a US institutional investor as well. Um, in that time, we've been fortunate to partner with some really great companies all over the world, and we've partnered with a bunch in Australia as well. Uh, one of the companies that we invested about a year ago that, that I think is a really great example of deep tech is Movis. And Movis has made a sensor that magnetically attaches to 
<coughs> to any fixed rotating machines. It then in encapsulates and, <coughs> and gathers a bunch of data about the machines, such as such as the the temperature, uh, sound, vibration, and current, and they incorporate third-party data like humidity in the area. They then use machine learning to predict the failure of the machine before it occurs. So that is a huge innovation if you're someone who owns a lot of assets and you care about maintenance. Um, so we're very excited by companies like that. And uh, a lot of interest here, as I said, you, you do a lot overseas, but there's plenty to invest in here in Australia at the moment? Yeah, correct. I mean, most of our portfolio in fairness is in in the US we've made seven investments in China so far where we have two local investors but you know in Australia we have backed I think eight companies so far you know we've backed another company Panviva which is in the customer experience space so they are basically trying to ingest information about uh, knowledge uh, where knowledge is stored in an organization to provide a unified view for agents in the in the contact center and um, and so that's a great improvement on the status quo as, a, as, a, as an agent answering calls. OK, Rob, let's go to, if it's deep tech, I mean, when you look at the future, I guess some of us wouldn't get past thinking 4G or 5G is going to be <laughs> pretty impressive. Give us some examples um, from what you're seeing from your company or what you're seeing on where we're going with deep tech, how it's going to affect us. How are we going to see it? Yeah, the way I touch see it, feel it. Yeah, well, you know, I think what you'll, you'll touch and you'll feel is um, an improvement in humans' ability to do what they want to do. So whether that's making better decisions about health, uh, and in our particular case, for example, you know, I talked before about replacing the physical site visit with that kind of virtual site visit. But imagine if you ask the question, how many solar panels are there in Sydney? How much power is that generating? How much power could we generate in Sydney with solar panels stuck on roofs? That's where machine learning and artificial intelligence, you know, for a human to sit down and look at every roof, measure the size of the roof and decide that, that's a massive task. So a machine could do that much faster. So they basically assist in what we're going to do every day, but either make the decision itself better or make the decision faster. So that's where I see it. I mean, and, and once you've got an enormous data set like we do, which is we've got, you know, it's 500 cities globally that we capture on, a, you know, every couple of months, uh, you have enormous amount of data about how the com uh, how cities are growing, demographic changes, where solar is being installed, all those kinds of things. It gives you insight into the world that helps us. Sally, and what you're doing, where is it going to change our lives? I think it's going to change our lives in the way that we understand our world in scientific discovery and I think that's really important for human beings and to know where we're going in the future. So this so, is the good bit, not the evil side. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. <laughs> so, for example, we're working with geologists to understand the possible trajectories of the Earth's evolution, how tectonic plates moved around, how, how, how stars are formed and we're actually using their science together with our mathematics and combining them together to get deep, deep insights, not shallow insights, but really deep insights into the way our world works, but also into the human condition too, because we also work with a lot of uh, social scientists. Do you, as somebody who's an expert in machine learning, do you feel you're at the cutting edge of technology? I mean, to you, is it a job, or do you actually feel every day, I am right on the edge of what they call the bleeding edge of technology? Uh, the latter. I actually feel very blessed that I am. I do what I love. So I feel I'm at the cutting edge every day. I am working with physicists, and we're using mathematics to help the physicists. We're using it to help social workers, and using it to help chemists. All of these things, uh, and we're new, we're inventing new mathematics. This is not about using applied stuff that's already existing. We are coming up at the centre, which I I run. We actually come up with new mathematical and machine learning techniques in order to discover more about our world. So, yeah, it's very much at the bleeding edge. Um, Albert, what do you see um, in your what you're investing in on how deep tech is going to change our lives? Where are some examples there? Yeah, I think there's lots of examples, um, and I think the changes will be really fundamental. So, one one example is autonomous systems. So, things like drones. Um, that are, are becoming actually very intelligent now. So not only can they sense their environment, but there are technologies which actually allow them to autonomously move in certain environments. And the, the, the speed of change is, is dramatic. So I think we, we are going to see just an incredible amount of change in the next few decades. You know, people talk about deliveries for, with drones. Um, you know, we have 
other sensors that can, can capture everything about the physical Earth and can do useful things with it, like pre predicting failures or um, telling us at what time a particular you know, delivery needs to arrive. And I think the change is enormous. That's actually a really... Yep. That's actually, sorry, that's a really important point, the autonomous vehicle one. I mean, I know it's, it's an evolution, mm. but the stats say that the number of accidents, vehicle accidents, mm. if you have fully autonomous vehicles, will reduce by a factor of 16. Yeah, we earlier. don't know yet, though, do we? No, but you can. You can actually model, <laughs> you can actually model this, right? There you go. That's and so, you know, about. it has amazing impacts on society, number one, on insurance companies, yeah. but also in terms of on us as people, right? Yeah. And, and some I mean, of you were just going to say that? Well, I, I was, I was, they're great prediction problems, but they're actually not going to solve our causal inference problems. They're not really telling us about our world. They're telling us about how well we can predict something that's going to happen tomorrow rather than a deep understanding, which I think is a necessary feature of deep, deep tech. Oh, we've got so much to talk about. We're going to um, wind this segment up and coming up we're going to talk about how to keep the best and brightest in Australia and should we be worried about machines taking over. Stick with us. This program proudly supported by ACS. Think ahead. Create the future. Change the world. to the Innovation Forum here at the ACS offices at Barangaroo in Sydney. We're talking deep tech tonight and our panel of experts, let me reintroduce them, Dr Rob Newman, CEO of location intelligence company Nearmap, from the University of Sydney, machine learning expert Professor Sally Cripps and venture capitalist Albert Bialinko from Telstra Ventures. Now we're going to get to the crux of it. You've made deep tech, deep tech. you've explained it, you've told us how important it is, how attractive it is. But where's the money coming from? Do we have enough money? Obviously, Elbert, this is your area. Um, you're from the venture capitalist arm of the, of the telecoms provider. So give us an idea. Is there a lot out there? What are you looking for? Because you, as you said in the last segment, you invest a lot overseas, about eight companies here. What is it you're looking at? Yeah, no, really great question. So we are looking for companies that are little today, but in the future could become really big companies. And we invest in often quite early stage, but promising companies, and we take on a lot of risks. And we adopt a portfolio approach, so some of them will not you know, achieve all they hope to, but some of them will grow and become huge. But what are you looking so, for? Yeah, so we look for, can we look at the status quo that a company is attacking and we ask how much does this change or this technology change the world for that customer? Is there someone that will actually pay for that product? And is it something they'll love? And then we look at how big could it be if it really takes off? So is this a, a problem a lot of groups have and a lot of people have? Or is it a very niche product uh, problem? So we, we really focus on um, also as well the team. Uh, is the team that's there, are the co-founders, are they the right people to deliver on the vision? Is there a lot of money around for deep tech? As I said in the last segment, is that the one everybody wants to get into? Because when apps were big, they were all in apps, as we know, apps. Um, but <laughs> yeah. is it now deep tech? Yeah, Is so there a lot of money going into it? Yeah, so there's been um, yeah, several billion dollars of venture capital that's been raised in Australia in the last three years. Wow. So um, you know, we're one of the funds that have raised money, but there's a few other really great funds out there as well. And okay. um, you know, I think every group, you know, deep tech as well as companies that you know produce an app, everyone thinks there's not enough money for their sector. That's right? what they've so, been complaining about for years. Yeah, I think the challenge with deep tech is it's it's just hard to really show enough progress because it does does, you know, we talked about it takes a long time and so, venture capitalists love to see progress over time. They do. Rob, you were a venture capitalist before focusing Correct. on near map, map full time. Do you agree with Albert? I mean, is there, is this the new, is there any danger of deep tech's just a fad term I and mean, just there's general technology and innovation going on anyway? And is there enough money for it? Oh, look, when I was in venture capital, um, on the money side, we always said there's not enough great <laughs> companies out there and the people on the other side were saying there's not enough money out there, right? Um, Albert's 100% right. Uh, great companies are made with really good deep technology with great management teams. If you put those two things together, the market, all those other things will sort themselves out. Do we out. have that in Australia? Enough of no, that? No, <clears throat> technology, yes. Money, yes. Management teams, no. What about uh, money? Yeah, money, well, we do. I mean, if there is a good technology that has a market opportunity, money will find it, guarantee it. 
the issue we have in Australia is we have not developed a commercialisation culture. And so even hiring people into the executive team at Nearmap, you know, we've got to take people and to build them into um, what we need, right? And I personally believe, and this is a passion of mine, is that we as Australians need to keep technology here and take it through the whole commercialisation life cycle. Don't licence it off overseas. Rob, we've been talking about that. I started on Business Sunday nearly 30 years ago, and oh, we yeah. were doing the same argument. Successive oh, governments that... And can I say, the lack of management expertise is not confined to the tech sector. Well, you could argue that... You could argue that there is... It's a cultural problem. No, I actually disagree. So, if you look at the mining industry, we are the world's leaders in mining, right? We, hands down. No problem at all, right? That's right. Focus, yeah. Yeah. Yes, but we are not world's leaders in technology commercialisation, right? And, you, you know, I've been in this industry for 30 years and I'm personally passionate about it, that if we don't build the company here, if we sell it off, licence it off, we will lose the opportunity to build that culture yeah. here. And I, but Sorry, I do think... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I, I agree with you, but I think the world is changing. I think now what we're seeing at the data science centres, of which I'm a director at Sydney Uni, but other ones too, is this... Uh, rapid turnover of uh, people coming along and, and developing these um, spin-off companies and being encouraged to both go work with academia and in um, and, and with the corporate world it's and doing now, research I want... actually in the corporate world. Yes. And there's hope, but I agree, so we, we're getting better. Getting better. But they are going off to the US. I want to specifically <laughs> ask you about that. I just, I lost, I just lost my co-director. OK, so there's the brain drain, because I, when we've had this argument over decades, everybody comes up with solutions. We do privatisation, we put experts in from business into academia, but it just still often doesn't work, does it? But I think I do think we're changing. Okay. And I think we need to focus on things like mining, the things that are of value to Australia, agriculture. The ones we do well. Yep because we're never going to compete with Silicon Valley. Yeah. Like and, in, and the apps. In consumer apps, <laughs> Australia doesn't have a strong yeah. track record. No. We didn't create yeah. Twitter, we didn't no. create Facebook. No. But there are some areas where Australians are the best. But aren't apps over? Isn't that the message tonight? <laughs> I think <laughs> not, it's harder over. to innovate, but yeah. I think they'll There's always be... There's more important be, things to do than get your pizza yes. delivery earlier, right? Correct. <laughs> I think if we're going to get this sort of funding and do this innovation, we have to be very targeted because we're not a big country. We don't have, you know, social media, we're never going to... Well, let's pick on. up on the brain drain issue. You said yep. you just lost someone to I the did, US. I did, my I did. I mean, I spent <laughs> some time in, in at Stanford. Yep. I was a yep. fellow there, and it was full of Australians. Australians. Yes, Some it is. Some come back, but not all. But it is also good that they go. I right. mean, I think that's a really important... I, I spent some of my career in the US. Um, I think it's really good that I've lost my co-director. I mean, I wanted him to come back, but he's, I know he's going to have a wonderful time over there. And when he does come back, he'll come Do back. Do they come back? Work. Um... Some. <laughs> I think it would be nice to is attract other people, talented people from different countries into Australia as well. Yeah. Albert, is that what you find when you're investing? I mean, yeah. are we losing the battle to keep people or attract? I mean, we always talk about the brain drain, mm. but, and I'll get to what governments can do, but we also have the problem attracting, which seems ridiculous given it's an attractive yeah. place to live. It's a very attractive place to live. We just don't have enough people who have certain types of experience in Australia. So, for example, there aren't a lot of people in Australia that have had the experience running technology for a product with millions of customers. Of course, in the US they have NASDAQ, Albert. Now, yeah. There's a whole um, stock market dedicated to this. Is that a problem for us? I mean, how can you compete with that? No, I think you'll find some Australian companies will eventually, you know, like Atlassian, who chose to list on, on in a US uh, market, I think you'll find some of the companies that do become best in the world from Australia will increasingly list both on the ASX yeah. and in the US. Rob, how, both are capital sources. How do we encourage companies like Atlassian to... Yeah, it's a shame, actually. Australia? I mean, I think, uh, you know, look, Atlassian, great company, but it's a shame that they've kind of kept Australia as the development group and, in fact, the headquarters over there, right? And, again, I think, as Australians, we've got a commitment, and that's what we're doing at Nearmap, a commitment to keep the commercialisation here. Now, to the question, and I agree 100% with Sally, which is um, we, you, we have to pick winners. And, you know, if you're going to vector into the conversation about government, 
um, government actually, if it has a role to play, which I sometimes argue against, but if they do have a role to play, they have to say we're going to be the world's best at mining technology. We're going to be the world's best at. But are you talking the government should pick winners? Because that's that's anathema to many, if, many. I know. So my my standing position is government should get out of the way. Right. Yeah. The everyone way. says that in business until they need help, and then it's my no, hands I mean, out. We've, we've built a great company. Okay. Without, you never um, took any grants or anything. No. Are we there's other than the R and D tax okay. rebate, but no, we don't take grants. We built okay. a real company. So you can do it. What? What job can government do? If they're going to get involved. <laughs> <laughs> right? They do need to say Australia is going to be good at this, right? And kind of... Uh, bring a critical mass, right? If you look at, we, I agree with Sally, we cannot compete against... Tell me what you're talking about specifically. Are you talking about things like not cutting the R&D um, support in the last budget? So... Those things, those programs actually cause more trouble in our industry than they help. Okay, even though you took some of the R&D... R&D tax credit is the only one... The reason why is it stayed around for a long period of time. All the other programs I'm keep... I'm probably going Sally, to disagree with you on yeah. this because obviously... <laughs> because without academia, government funding... Uh, yes, we, it is crucial. But increasingly, we are getting our funding from industry. Mm. So, um, is and that a good thing, though? Because we've seen a lot of conflicts of interest on it and some... It depends, we've done pretty again, well until now... With it depends. The so we've academic. been very lucky. You know, we've got great mining companies to invest and they've given us a pretty broad scope in which we can do research. And so I, I think that it is good that we get industry in because we actually have to prove impact. Mm. Uh, and I think academics have been a bit slack in Australia about proving impact. Uh, so I think getting industry is good. But I think also forming partnerships with overseas universities is actually also a really good way to go. We've got a partnership with a, something called the Alan Turing Institute in the UK and they were particularly interested in us because they wanted to learn more about the mathematics of how you would figure out what's under the ground, so the mining. And they've come in and so they've then given us a lot of skills. But there'll always be a role for government funding though, I presume. You can't take it all from... Abs it's not going to end up like the US where no. they're so reliant on private. No, no. We are different to that. No. So we would get most of our funding from government but in increasing increasingly more from industry, and I don't see them as being a, an either-or. I think that actually government and industry should actually work together. Albert, on, from your point of view, um, without being critical of your industry, I always love the way VCs come in. They take the advantage. Our wonderful academics develop things. They do it. They're terrible at commercialisation. Certain companies succeed, but... I won't call you vultures, but there used to be that term. <laughs> but you come in and get a lot of the expertise that's there that other the taxpayers have paid for. Um, when you're doing startups, that's fine. But in some cases, do you think um, that you really are getting the advantage of a country that spends a lot in this area, or do you think we don't spend enough? I think we're miles behind the rest yeah. of the world here. Inspired. I mean, look at what's happening in China. I mean, you've got private startups there raising a billion dollars of capital in, in the blink of an eye. But they eye. have a billion people too. They have a billion people and their government is exceptionally supportive of local companies and what we're seeing for the first time ever I'd argue is Chinese companies being the best in the world even in overseas company in, in overseas markets. In their own technology not Yeah so else's. a Chinese company like TikTok being widely adopted throughout the world rather than just doing well in China so I think we're in an arms race in technology and we Australia needs to have strong technologies so we don't end up in a situation that we're just buying technology. Can the government do more? The government can do more. It can, um, I think it, you know, it has, I was a little disappointed that technology, you know, became a sideshow and was very defocused in the election. Hmm. Um, I think that being, uh, recognising the importance of technology as a future employment area is critical. It will create a ton of jobs in Australia. It will create a lot of high paid jobs that have median incomes above 100k if we have knowledge workers in Australia developing software and hardware. Rob, final question to you on that. Um, we saw an election where the future, they talk about the future, but not about the future of jobs, not about technology. We know innovation apart from on this program is something they run away from. Yeah. Do you worry that we're looking backwards, not enough forwards from a government point of view? Because it all comes down to education in the end. And what we we're are, doing yeah. on STEM, we're, just, we're, technology. we're not funded to the same extent as the US. Well, we're but, not the China. Yeah. So they, for every dollar of research, the US then kicks in, the government kicks in 70 cents. And for us, it's for every dollar, it's about 30 cents. So yeah. we're way behind. Look, you know, again, I think um, a government in Australia, uh, at least in, in the recent election, it was all about tax, right? That was really what it was about. There wasn't any vision at all 
in that discussion in the election, right? I think there is a time now, you know, we have a government in place, it's an opportunity for them to kind of st stand back and say, OK, what do we want to do if we want to be part of this? I still come back to, if government has a role, they do need to say, if we're going to... I mean, I clearly agree they need to back research, mm. but let's pick areas where we can be the world's best, because mm. if we try and spread ourselves to compete against mm. China, we've got no hope, yeah, right? Exactly, OK. So pick an area. Yep. Well, there you go. And let's hope whoever is the Innovation Technology Minister is watching, let's hope we actually have a science minister because it wasn't too many years ago we didn't even have one of those so uh, there's the message we're going to take a break but coming up after the break we're going to explore the darker side of deep tech does it really exist are the machines going to take over our panel will tell you don't go away to the Innovation Forum here at the ACS offices at Barangaroo in Sydney. Tonight we're talking deep tech and now we get to the nub of it. Are the computers going to take over? Is that science fact or is it science fiction? Here we go. From the Matrix to 2001 Space Odyssey, since computers were invented, our most creative storytellers have imagined a future where the robots take over and we're all held hostage to invention. But is there any truth to this science fiction? One of the most celebrated personalities behind machine learning and the application of AI, Elon Musk, warns that our future could be scarier than even our wildest dreams. Very close to the, to the cutting edge in AI and it scares the hell out of me. Um, it's capable of vastly more than almost anyone knows and the rate of improvement is exponential. The rate of improvement is really dramatic but we have to figure out some way to ensure that the advent of digital superintelligence is one which is symbiotic with humanity. I think that's the single biggest existential crisis that we face and the, and the most pressing one. It's going to be very tempting to use AI as a weapon. In fact, it will be used as a weapon. The danger is going to be more humans using it against each other, I think. I try to convince people to slow down, slow down AI, to regulate AI. This was futile. You just can't go around killing people. Why? But not everyone agrees. But you've got Hollywood and the extremes there. I mean, it makes for good copy to say the machines are taking over the right. world and the threat. How do you explain that that's fiction and we're actually right or is there still a tiny little element that you have to concede maybe there is something there no i, I don't think there's anything there i think what we what we have to do is continue to show clients the, applic the applicability it is topical at the moment and and everyone is concerned about what is the outcome of ai when we apply ai so ethical ai we have a pretty strong point of view on has three elements one it has to be around augmenting human intelligence so it's, 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 it's driving everyone to a better outcome. It has to be around you own your data and the insights that come from any AI experience with that data. So you own that, not anybody else. And thirdly, the, um, the, the openness and the transparency of how the, the information and the insights come. So how, what, is, what are uh, the algorithms that are being applied around AI? And so those sort of three principles that we're operating on is what we see as a framework for ethical AI. So, Professor Sally Cripps, you're an expert in machine learning. Do we have to worry about the computers? Taking over the world as a form of a super... Or just getting too smart. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that uh, you'll notice in that clip that we just saw, uh, all the ones of the robots taking over the world were actually, in fact, Hollywood movies, right? So there are no such <laughs> robots in existence at the moment. Thank God. At the moment. <laughs> at, and I would quote, and as much respect as I have for Elon Musk, who's an incredibly visionary guy, he is not an AI expert. Uh, and whereas Andrew Ung is, and I will quote him to say that, you know, he worries about a super intelligent being the same way that he worries about overpopulation on Mars before he's even set foot on it. So I think that the real risk of focusing on this super intelligent being is that you move the conversation away from serious ethical issues, such as data ownership, such as that the data which is that you uh, have is owned by and used by companies that you don't even know have it. And that is an important issue, I think, privacy. Rob, 
Elon Musk is, is a brilliant man, so we can't just dismiss him as a scaremonger on this. Does he have any point, or at least on the issue, that Sally's picked up about our values, that there's something here we need to look at, that it's all not just the maths and the algorithms, there's something else we've got to put into consideration as we move forward? Look, I think Elon's taken the idea too far, right? I mean, the Terminator 2 and so on, you know, those are sentient beings. And we, the technology we have today is far away from self-awareness. So, again, I think he's taking the issue too far. Um, like all new technologies, it can help humans, and they usually do, but it can also be used against humans. Whether it's the motor vehicle, it has a great benefit, but it also, there's accidents, right? Every technology we invent can be used for good or for bad. And by and large, as, as human beings, we tend to use technology for good, we tend to self-regulate, and when necessary, governments and or regulators get involved to help. And in our industry, I mean, we're collecting an enormous amount of data about the real world, um, we self-regulate. You know, we don't show people's faces, we don't show license plates, we self-regulate. Some people, you might be a good guy, but some people do abuse it. They can use technology. They can, and, and that's where, as an industry, if we don't self-regulate as an industry, then uh, that's when government... Like the banks. Well. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> and the other point is that we're changing so quickly mm. and that, you know, expecting the regulators to come in and update it is actually not realistic. So, so the self-regulation is really important, but it's very hard to ensure. Oh, but when you're investing, what do you think of this argument on ethics and where we're going and the values we need to share? Yeah, so I think it's incredibly important. Um, I think, you know, I, we like companies that get better over time. The technology doesn't get commoditized, it gets better. And usually there's some form of learning from the data. And so that often means that you might anonymize all the data that you collect from your customers and extract learnings that improve the way you can operate for individual customers. Um, so that, that is part of the benefit of a system getting smarter and that, that will provide a lot of value for every customer individually. But it's incredibly important how the data is handled. It's incredibly, cyber security is incredibly Incredibly important, and we've got a big position in a, in a few different cybersecurity companies. So I think it's an area of extreme focus for us. Sally, I want to ask you specifically because of machine learning, it, it's data that feeds it, or data's around it. Who controls and owns the data is very important, and can machines share our values? Do we have to make sure that when we're feeding the information and the data, that we also make sure so I think there's that a protection? The and the protection must be around the algorithms that are used that are transparent. We need to understand understand how those machines are making the decisions. They're just making decisions. Machines are not ethical or unethical. Humans are. Mm. Uh, and so we need to be have that sort of regulation around transparency. Yeah. But the data issue, the, the cyber security, these are really important issues um, that I think that uh, need addressing. Yeah. And bias can creep in, right, with machine learning because you're learning from how something is done and improving it over time. There's definitely a risk that if the initial data set is you know, it's, it's skewed towards one group that it can introduce um, bias. And that's where the predictive policing, yes. So you get bias because if you... What is predictive policing? OK, so predictive policing is where you have an algorithm that tells the police car where to go. So, uh, you know, when it's patrolling. And so if you go to the most commonly... Uh, uh, area that, that that has crime, it may be sort of Redfern in, in Sydney, I'm just picking a, an area, uh, and you keep going back to that area, you you will have bias in your algorithms, not because the algorithms are biased, because your your data is biased, your sampling, not from a random sample, but constantly. So it becomes How do you a, overcome that? You actually build into the algorithms to explore, so you're not just interested in the most likely outcome, but in the whole distribution of outcomes, and that's where the maths comes in. My goodness me. Rob? What kind of... You talked about self-regulation, but we've seen... biggest example is Facebook. How do we avoid another Facebook? Self-regulation has not worked there. We won't uh, avoid um, another Facebook, right? And I think what happens is... And if you look at um, what, uh, what's, what um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg is doing now at Facebook, is he's actually changing his business model because he's realised he's created... Uh, a data issue. I mean, all of that sharing that was great 10 years ago, all that sharing of our personal information has now been abused, and he's realised if his business is going to succeed, he needs to change it to much more of a point-to-point -point messaging platform than it being a social media platform. And so, again, humans will kind of say, 
if my data or if I'm being abused, I'm not going to use that service. And it's very easy to give up on Facebook, for example. But shouldn't, they, shouldn't Facebook just give back the data to the people and then the people can decide whether they want to share it with Facebook? <coughs> they tried, so, so they actually so tried that, right? local ownership of your own data and then you make the money from sharing it with the companies. Yeah, but they actually tried that. So that, you know, the privacy uh, controls that they put into Facebook, you can control it, but 99% of people don't bother. Mm. And, right. and then you do have people so that, it's like Cambridge, Anal process. Cambridge Analytics, I think it was, yes, that actually yes, abused the Adam situation, Adam. right? But That's again, it. See, so yeah. there you go. There has oh, there to be will, some will, regulation, will, doesn't it? Well, no, because again, if that we data can't is rely about, on the media. They, we, we're shrinking. No, but the point, the <laughs> we point, can't expose all this. The point, but will be, is that Facebook won't exist in ten years' time if it continues with its, its existing business model. Because if that data is out there and we feel like our privacy is being abused, we won't use I, that service. I'm not as confident as you. <laughs> I'm an optimistic person. <laughs> uh, around that, I do think there needs to be legislation. I think there's always needed to be a, a legislation around privacy, whether it's from data well, now sure. or from you know in the past, you know when there was just. Uh, you know, before the digital age, mm. there always was legislation to protect people's privacy, and I think... So one, to do it now. one downside of forcing legislation is that Facebook has the resources and has armies of lawyers to, to meet the legislation, but you might get to a situation where you stifle new entrants because they just can't fund all these lawyers and they can't meet all the requirements day one. So I think if there is legislation, we need to find a way to actually foster competition. So it's not just, you know, we have 300 lawyers, we can handle any regulation we, we like, but these four startups, you know, they need to fundraise every year and they're not... So be able to do that. The same challenges, it's clear deep tech is going to face the same challenges as shallow tech as anything and um, obviously we've learnt a lot and I cannot thank you all enough. We could obviously talk all night but at least our viewers are going to know what deep tech is and where we're going. I want to thank our panel tonight, Dr Rob Newman, CEO of Location Intelligence Company Nearmap from the University of Sydney, machine learning expert Professor Sally Cripps and venture capitalist Albert Berlinko from Telstra Ventures. Um, as I said, thank you all very much. I think we can uh, take it that we've learned something more about de deep tech and it's going to be something you will be hearing a lot more from. And you'll be hearing from us on the Innovation Forum, back with uh, more, the show that's not afraid to use the I word. And now we have new government back in town. We'll be interested to see what the future holds. But coming up next, the great Paul Murray. I'll be interested to see what he tells us the future holds. Stay tuned on Sky News. This program proudly supported by ACS. Think ahead. Create the future. Change the world.